I'll throw light on the types uh, again back to the to the um, to the lecture. So it is the laser that is built to be specific to an eye to improve quality and quantity of vision. So the aim of it is to improve the quality more than the quantity of vision. So what is the indication or what are the indications? Actually, there must be symptoms related to high, higher order aberrations and there is an objective um, a clue like affection of the PSF or the MTF um, or the MTF, of course, it is the contrast sensitivity uh, uh, affected by the higher order aberrations. So as you see, the common thing is the higher order aberrations causing symptoms and causing affection of contrast sensitivity and the P PSF or the point spread function. Now, why I'm insisting on causing symptoms and affecting contrast sensitivity, it means that these higher order aberrations are out of the neural adaptation. Uh, so they are not native, okay? They are not native higher order aberrations because the native higher order aberrations, although they are abnormal, but the brain got used to them. So we must not touch them. We must uh, just keep it as it is because if we uh, um, treat those uh, native higher order aberrations, we are going to create abnormality, which the mind, the brain, maybe sometimes cannot get used to it. <coughs> so higher order aberrations causing symptoms and affecting the contrast sensitiv sensitivity. This is an example where the patient has some irregularities on the cornea and these irregularities are causing higher order aberrations, especially coma and affecting the PSF and the MTF, as you see here. Okay. Now, what is the goal? The aim of the customized laser vision correction is to improve the quality and quantity of vision. So the uh, priority is for the quality of vision, not for the quantity of vision. Of course, if we achieve both, that would be perfect. But if we cannot, then we have to, do, we have to improve the quality rather than the quantity. This is very important. Just to show you uh, or to highlight this concept, to put it in mind, I'm going to show you this um, example. Now in the middle, before the customized laser vision correction, and on the left, after customized laser vision correction, look at the irregularity in the surface in the middle, which is before, and look at the regular surface, although there is astigmatism, but it is regular astigmatism, very regular surface, after the customized laser vision correction. And on the right, you can see the job that the customized laser profile did, okay? It regularized the cornea. So uh, it, for sure, the quality of vision improved because in the middle, it was irregular astigmatism with high comma, while on the left, it is very regular astigmatism without comma. So irregularity has been removed and the quality of vision was improved and maybe the quantity of vision just the same, maybe same refractive error, okay? So this is the main aim of customized laser vision correction. Okay, now let's go ahead again, but do not alter the native higher order aberrations. I want you to remember if the patient doesn't suffer from any high order aberrations or the MTF, PSF are not affected, then no need to treat those higher order aberrations, okay? Now, in general, the indications are as follows. Maybe primary asymmetry in the virgin eye. It is just normal eye, no problems at all. The cornea is transparent no previous operations, no keratoconus, but there is asymmetric astigmatism. As you see here, it is primary asymmetry. Maybe it is small optical zone. So the aim is to enlarge the zone. Maybe recentration of the decentered optical zone, okay? Maybe keratoconus, we want to regularize the cornea. Maybe 
irregularities of corneal transplantation. Or maybe it is unspecific irregularity. Now, what is the unspecific irregularity? The unspecific irregularity happens because of corneal scars or flap complications after LASIK, like macrostriae or folds, incomplete flap, buttonhole, ablated hinge. Okay, so why it is called unspecific irregularity? Because it doesn't take a pattern. You find that more than one pattern, you may find inferior steep with superior steep or uh, multi spots of steepness, as in this case. So it is unspecific because it doesn't take a, uh, a specific shape, while others, they take specific shape. For, for example, the primary asymmetry, usually it is asymmetric foot high with or without skewed radial axis. The small optical zone is central. The decentered zone, it is decentered zone. The keratoconus, you know the patterns of keratoconus and pillar cell marginal regeneration. So they take patterns. Corneal transplantation as well can be under the name of unspecific irregularities, but I put it separate because uh, we know the cause of it. It is because of corneal transplant. Okay, now let's divide these indications into two groups. The first group is regular irregularity, okay? They are regular irregularity, while the other group is irregular irregularity, okay? Because in the irregular irregularity, many patterns, many shapes, and specific. In the regular irregularity, specific shape, okay? It is irregularity, but has a specific shape. This is why it is regular irregularity. Now, why I'm classifying these as, as like this? Because according to that, we can decide which treatment is the best. Okay. Now we come to the types of customized laser vision correction. First, phototherapeutic keratectomy, which is PTK. It is just simple PTK. Or topography guided treatment or wavefront guided treatment. Three types of customized laser vision correction. Okay. Now, before I start, I want to show you the Reinstein's rule of epithelium modulation because it has a, an effect on the decision. The normal corneal epithelium, the central thickness is usually 54 microns. Okay, so the normal corneal epithelium is homogeneous and the central corneal thickness is around 54 microns. The second rule is corneal epithelium thickness, uh, thickens, sorry, to fill depressions. As you see here, this is corneal irregularity because of the scar and look at the epithelium, how it changes its thickness in order to create a homogeneous anterior surface of the cornea. This is the filling effect, okay? Or the modeling effect. Look at this uh, uh, example. It is after intracorneal ring implantation and look at the very thick epithelium just above the rings in order to smoothen the anterior corneal surface. This is the same picture. Look at the epithelium, which is very thick just above the intracorneal rings. Rule number three, corneal epithelium thins over peaks or protrusions, such in this case. This is a case of keratoconus. Over the cone, the, the, the epithelium is very thin. Why? Because to uh, uh, smoothen the anterior corneal surface. Rule number four, the ru a rule of proportional changes it changes proportionally to stroma, to stroma changes. What does it, this mean? It means that there is an agreement between the stroma and the epithelium in order to create a smooth anterior surface. If the, if the stroma bulges out, the epithelium thins. If the stroma is flat, the epithelium thickens. Okay? So, Look at this area where the stroma bulges, bulges out in this area. 
the corresponding area in the epithelium is thin in order to hide the irregularity of the stroma. Look at the anterior elevation. Almost there is no irregularity. Compare the anterior elevation with the stromal elevation. You can find that the epithelium, because of the agreement with the stroma, okay, it thins over this protrusion in order to hide it. Okay. This is a similar, as you see, flat stroma with thick epithelium in order to hide the irregularity of the stroma. Look at the anterior elevation, almost nothing. Okay, very clear. Okay, post myopic, as you see, the epithelium thickens in the center, very thick in the center because the stroma is very flat. And this is the cause of regression after myopic treatment, especially with the small optical zone. Remember this, if you choose a small optical zone, you will create a possibility of uh, myopic regression, more myopic regression. So don't play with the optical zone just to treat patients because many doctors with high diopters they think that, okay, let's go for, four, for five millimeters or 5.5 millimeters to treat minus eight or minus nine, okay? Because the corneal thickness does not allow if we want to go for 6.5 millimeter, which is the standard one. So in this case, we are creating very small optical zone and very high regression. The patient will come with high regression, okay? Rule number five, rule of the amount of change. The magnitude of epithelium, of epithelium change is defined by the rate of curvature change of the stromal surface. I think I talked about this. This is why there is higher regression in small myopic ablated zone and explains less incidence of regression with large blended zones. The last rule is epithelial limit of compensation, irregular astigmatism means that the irregularity is out of epithelium capacity of compensation. This explains what I mean. Let's assume that this is the stroma. The stroma bulges out. The epithelium can thin over the, the, the stroma in order to hide the irregularity, all right? You have thinned epithelium, but regular anterior surface. Now let's assume that this bulging is more in the stroma. So it became out of the capacity of the epithelium. In this case, the, the irregularity will appear on the anterior corner surface. This means that whenever you see any irregularity on corneal surface, it means that the irregularity in the stroma became very high, so the epithelium couldn't uh, uh, compensate for, all right? Now, we go back to the types of customized laser vision correction. PTK, topographic guided treatment, wave round guided treatment. We start with the PTK. What is the aim of the PTK? In the PTK, we have irregular stroma, irregular epithelium, okay? and we want to ablate in order to create a smooth surface on the stroma and leave the job to the epithelium to cover it with a smooth layer of epithelium. And that's it. The irregularity has gone. This is the principle of the PTK. What is the principle of topography guided treatment? It is, we are going to ablate the protruded area, the high elevated area of the anterior cor corneal surface. And we are going to, so let's say, we are going to flatten the steep area and we are going to steepen the flat area. Okay, so we are going to, to make a balance. The steep should be ablated and the flat should be elevated. So the profile, as you see here, we are going to ablate the, the cone and we are going to ablate the periphery of the flat area, okay? Ablating the cone is similar to myopic ablation. 
and ablating the periphery of the flat area is the same prim principle of the hyperopic treatment, all right? So this is the principle of the topography guided treatment. This is again, we ablate the steep and we ablate the periphery of the flat, okay? Now we come to the wavefront guided treatment. Wavefront guided treatment, the real wavefront guided treatment is ocular wavefront guided treatment, ocular, not corneal, okay? It depends on sending a spot of light, it is just one point, spot of light inside the eye to the retina. And this spot of light will reflect from the retina because the retina plays a role of a mirror, all right? Now, a concave mirror, of course. Now, the light, the reflected light, will go through the media of the eye and will suffer from the higher order aberrations, and then it will be uh, received on the filters, the lenses of the machine. According to that, there will be uh, a map, let's say, of the higher order abrasions, of the ocular higher order abrasions. And according to that, the uh, profile will be built in order to treat the higher order abrasions, okay? Okay, as you see, this is the profile of the ocular wavefront. It is similar to the topography guided treatment, but I'll show you the difference. Now, what is corneal wavefront? Corneal wavefront actually is topography guided treatment, all right? Because it depends on the elevation map. So this is an example. This is the elevation map of corneal surface, and this is the corneal wavefront of the same surface. So we are deriving the corneal wavefront, okay? Not We are calculating, the machine is calculating, not directly measuring, it is calculating the corneal wavefront from the elevation map, all right? So the treatment is based on the elevation map, it's very similar to the topography guided treatment. So corneal wavefront is not a real wavefront. Okay, what are the measurement tools? Measurement tools, a barometer for ocular wavefront, which is real wavefront, elevation-based, for the topo-guided treatment. And it is of two types, topographers, placido-based, and tomographers, Scheinflug-based, all right? Now, what are the differences between these three? According to that, we can understand when to use this, when to use that, because this was the main question that one of the colleagues asked me, uh, uh, in a Swiss university when they said, okay, we don't know when to go for this, when to go for that. Okay, this is the answer. Now, what is the difference? Which one depends on pupil center? Which one is based on the area which is centered with the pupil center? It is the ocular wave front. So it is measuring the higher order aberrations through the pupil. So if the pupil is four millimeters, it can measure accurately only four millimeters, not six millimeters. And if the pupil is seven millimeters, it can give you up to seven millimeters, the higher order abrasions. But remember, the ocular wavefront is centered with the pupil center, not the visual axis. And here we come to the vertex. Vertex means visual axis. Now, which one measures the higher order aberrations or builds the laser profile around what? Around the, the vertex, the visual axis. It is only the placido based, remember. Now, just to know very well what I mean by the to tomographer, Scheinflug based, okay? It is the oculizer. The oculizer is of wave of, uh, oculizer of wave light. Okay, it is shine flock based, not placido based. So it gives the profile, not with the pupil center, 
not with the visual access, all right, but it gives it and not does not take into uh, account angle kappa. And I will show you around what it, it gives the, uh, the, uh, the profile. So the aperometer, the ocular wave front, okay, around the pupil center does not take into consideration angle kappa and it is not around vertex or the visual axis. The topographer, which is placido based, it does, uh, uh, it is around the visual axis and it takes into consideration angle kappa and it is not related to pupil center. And the tomographer, none of these, all right? Now, the topographer and the tomographer are based on cornea, not and as based on on the ocular um, uh, wave front, okay? It is just based on the cornea. Therefore, both can give you the higher order abrasions based on whatever you like, optical zone, um, not optical zone, I mean, what, whatever you like, the measured zone, whether it is six millimeter, eight millimeter. So they give real information from the cornea. But the ocular wave front, as I said, they are very much affected by the pupil size. We cannot say that pupil size is four millimeter and this is the wave front of, the, of six millimeter. This is rubbish. Four millimeter pupil means only four millimeter are valid and the rest are just extrapolated, estimated by the machine. They are not real. So remember, Pupil center affects the ocular wave front measurement. Okay, now which tool is better? Okay, let's assume that we are going to treat this decentered zone. This decentered zone, we want to recenter it. Okay, the patient, of course, is suffering from coma. Okay, and this is the pupil. All right, now because this is the, the pupil, the aberometer, because it is based on the pupil center, it's going to measure the wave front and build the laser profile based on this area. Okay. And centered with the pupil center. Now we come to the topographer, placido based. Because it is based on the visual axis, so it's going to use this where the red X is, okay? You see the difference? So maybe, maybe the comma measured by the ocular wave front is just 0 0.2 or, and uh, by the topographer, it is maybe, uh, let's say uh, 0 0.4 or vice versa, okay? So it is based on the visual axis. Now we come to the tomographer, which is shine flow based. It is centered around the apex of the cornea, the highest point of the cornea called the apex. And usually it is in between, usually, all right? So which one should be considered as a treatment? Of course, the one which is centered with the visual axis is the most accurate. Now, which one do you think is most accurate? Of course, we have to remove the tomographer. Don't depend on oculizer, okay? Don't depend on oculizer. I have a very good experience with the oculizer. The results are not as good as if you are using the topolizer, for example, or other machines similar to the, the, the topogra topographer or the uh, aperometer. So don't depend on the oculizer. So we are going to remove it. Now, which one do you think is more accurate? Actually, this depends on angle kappa. If angle kappa is very small, then almost the same. You can use this one or that one. If angle kappa is very large, topo is better than ocular. The topographer, is better and more accurate than the ocular. So as you see, you have to measure angle kappa. 
because the ocular wavefront does not consider angle kappa, does not measure it, and does not compensate for it. So the topographer Placido base is the, is the best. Now we come to epithelial map. It's very important. In order to do very good customized laser vision correction, you have to measure the epithelial map, okay? Because of the filling effect of the epithelial map. Now we come to the treatment in detail. As I said, we have two sets, the regular irregularity and the irregular irregularity. Okay. If it is regular irregularity, you can go for topography guided treatment or wavefront guided treatment. But, but if, it, if it is irregular irregularity, you have to go for PTK. So very simple. Irregular irregularity, PTK. Regular irregularity, either topographic guided treatment or wavefront guided treatment based on angle kappa or what you have machine. But the more accurate is the topography guided. So as you see, this is the PTK. We are going to remove and then to create a new surface. But by this, you are changing the shape of the cornea inducing refractive error. You are flattening the stroma. So you are inducing hypermetropia. So be careful. And this is affected by some factors. The first factor is how deep you are ablating. If you are ablating just the tips, it's not like if you are going deeper or deeper. In addition, the profile laser of the PTK very much affects. You have to ask the, not the engineer, because the engineer were lions before Sinjab Academy era, okay? But don't ask the engineers, you have to ask the manufacturers. What is the laser profile you are providing the PTK, okay, uh, with, the, with the PTK? If it is flat, you are inducing huge refractive error. If it is aspheric, it is very nice. So be sure of what you are going to do. So if you are creating flat, it will eat so much tissue and it will cause high refractive error. So steep or flat. In addition, yeah, that's it. So the deeper, the more the refractive effect, the larger the optical zone. Remember, the larger the optical zone, the less the refractive effect, and the flatter the, the shape of the laser profile, the more the refractive effect, okay? These are three rules and precautions for the PTK. Therefore, the recommendations are use the least depth and leave the epithelium do the rest of the job because we need just to regularize the cornea. We don't want to eat the stroma. Remember that the epithelium has a filling effect. So you can maybe remove some and le let the epithelium remodel. Use large optical zone, don't use small optical zone. Use the aspheric surface if available rather than the flat surface. So this is an example for the PTK. Just we want to remove the tips. Don't go uh, uh, deeper in the, in the stroma. Now we come to the topography guided treatment and wavefront guided treatment. It is just for regular irregularity. Okay. The topography guided treatment is indicated when there is large angle kappa because it compensates for angle kappa. It takes care of the visual axis and use it when there is significant geographical irregularity. Okay, significant geographical irregularity. What is the significant irregularity? It is small optical zone, decentered optical zone, or keratoconus. Therefore, if there is primary asymmetry and the patient is not suffering because the primary asymmetry is uh, usually associated with native high order abrasions, 
do not do topography guided treatment. So do not do contoura. Okay, just remember, do not do contoura for every eye, eyes of cats, eyes of, of people. Okay, marketing, marketing, marketing. Don't do contoura for the eyes that are not suffering from the native higher order abrasions because the, the contour actually is topo-guided treatment. So the topo-guided treatment is for diseased cornea, not for the normal cornea. Okay, some people may claim, okay, but we are getting very good results by the contour. Of course, Schwind people will say the same for their profiles. Uh, Zeiss people will say the same for their profiles. Let, let us, all of us, be scientific. Don't compromise normal tissue if the brain is not suffering. For example, if you don't feel pain or headache, do you take painkiller? Killer? Nobody will take painkiller. If I, I'm not suffering of headache, why to take painkiller? All right, so the topography guided treatment is for enlarging the zone because it is significant geographical irregularity. It is for recentration for decentered optical zone because it is significant geographical irregularity. It is for treatment of keratoconus when indicated, of course, and when the criteria are met, okay? Because keratoconus is a major, is a significant geographical irregularity. Okay. Now, this is the platform of the topography guided treatment on the wave light. Of course, I have no financial interest, but just to show you some things. This is the version profile before you put the, uh, uh, the refractive error that you are going to treat as well. But you have to, to be sure that the larger the optical zone, the better the result, okay? And the less compromising the cornea and the more predictable results, okay? Now, always uh, uh, pay attention to the central ablation. How much central ablation? Because the central ablation will create refractive error, as you see. Okay, so we are treating centrally 10 microns. So we are almost as, as if we are treating, uh, for example, one diopter or less of myopia. So this profile will cause hyperopic shift. Now, this is for the six millimeter, the central uh, ablation increased to 12. This is for the 6.5 millimeters. It is for uh, the, the central ablation is almost 13. So you can compensate for this by just adding plus one sphere to the laser profile to compensate for this uh, uh, induced refractive error. Now, don't do it very simple like this because it is very sophisticated. And if you want to do it, you have to be very experienced, okay? And try to do it with people who are very expert in this. Be otherwise, you may create disasters because there are many, many other things that you have to take care of, especially if there is uh, a disparity between the manifest astigmatism and what the, the system gives you about topographical astigmatism. Maybe you will find that the topo astigmatism is at axis 70, while the manifest astigmatism is at axis 20. So which one to use? Therefore, you have to be expert in order to touch the patient with this uh, topography guided treatment. Okay. Regarding the corneal wavefront, it is topography guided treatment as well but it is editable topography guided treatment. I love this system actually. Okay, why? Because it is selectable. I can see here, for example, that the patient is suffering from trefoil and coma. So I don't want to treat the whole list of high order aberrations. I just want to get rid of these two. Okay, and the spherical aberration, for example. So, I have to be sure that it is six millimeter measured in six millimeter because this is the standard. And then 
I go to the eczema machine. I take off all, okay? I switch them off and just I click on what I want to treat, all right? And this is the laser profile, very simple. And of course, I have to compensate for what is going to be created by this, by adding sphere, deducting sphere, so on. So it is sophisticated, but very friendly and less sophisticated than the topography guided treatment because topo is something all together. Here it is the corneal wavefront, which is topography guided treatment. It is editable. You can choose whatever you like. Wavefront guided treatment is something, okay, yeah. Wavefront guided treatment, you can use it, of course, whenever you have small angle kappa, large mesopic pupil. I forgot to, to write it here. Large mesopic pupil, so mesopic pupil. Okay. Large mesopic pupil, so you can get better measurements of the wavefront guided treatment, not like three millimeter or four millimeter, because if it is three, four, the six millimeter higher order abrasions are estimated or extrapolated. Okay, so if it is large mesopic pupil, that will be okay, especially if the small uh, the angle kappa is small, and there is insignificant geo geographical irregularity. For example. the primary asymmetry inversion eyes. This is if the patient is suffering, then we can go for that. Or keratoconus if it is mild, early stage, okay? And usually the, um, the, the laser profile by the ocular wavefront guided treatment is very similar to the corneal wavefront because it gives the profile based on the higher order abrasions. So as a take home message, you have to classify the irregularity. You have to study the epithelium. Do not alternative high order abrasions. Do not listen to marketing, okay? Improve the quality with the minimum possible ablation. Compensate for the induced refractive error. And of course, you have to depend the, the best to depend on is the topographer rather than the tomographer. And thank you very much. <laughs>